After a long night of drinking in April of 1983, Metallica's Dave Mustaine was woken up by his bandmates James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, and Cliff Burton and was told that he was out of the band. There was no room for reasoning. They had made their decision, and they already knew who his replacement was. On the four-day bus ride from New York to California, Dave Mustaine saw one word in a pamphlet that would change metal forever and set him up for a feud that has lasted for decades. In the last video, we talked about Slipknot and Mushroom Head. This time, we're going to talk about what went down after Dave Mustaine was fired by Metallica. Dave was the original guitarist of Metallica, recruited by co-founders James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich. But his alcohol abuse led to him being ousted from the group in 1983, the year that thrash metal was born. If the split had never happened, then we wouldn't have ever gotten Megadeth. So it's a perfect example of the cliche, everything happens for a reason. We're going to go back, though, more than 40 years of this historic rivalry. What was the pamphlet about? What happened when Megadeth opened for Metallica in the 90s? What are Dave and James texting each other about? You think you know this feud? Let's see how much you really know. Before we get into the match, we have to introduce the opponents. Dave Mustaine was born in California in September of 1961 and formed Megadeth in 1983, which released its first album two years later. Another 15 albums later, and Dave is still one of the most iconic musicians in the thrash metal scene. Lars Ulrich and James Hetfield formed Metallica in Los Angeles in 1981, and their first record came out in 83. They have 11 studio albums as of 2024 and remain one of the biggest names in music, selling out stadiums around the world. On April 11th, 1983, Dave was told he was out of Metallica. His erratic behaviors caused by his drinking were the culprit, and James, Lars, and bassist Cliff Burton had had enough. Plus, they already hired Kirk Hammett to be their new guitarist. James dropped Dave off at the bus terminal in New York City, and he was on his way back to California while the rest of the band continued working on their debut, Kill Em All, with their new guitar player. Dave felt betrayed because the firing seemed very out of nowhere to him, despite him acknowledging that his alcohol abuse was problematic later on. We all were such drunk. And when I got drunk, I got violent. When they got drunk, they got stupid. His rage fueled a fire inside of him. And like many other artists, he used it as inspiration to write new songs for the band he planned to form when he got back home on the West Coast. He didn't have anyone in mind to join him yet, but he called it Megadeth after seeing the word in a political pamphlet by California Senator Alan Cranston about the dangers of nuclear weapons. Over the years, Dave has made his feelings about his former Metallica bandmates pretty clear, but it wasn't a one-sided situation. So let's break it down. All the drama is making me hungry though, so before we get into it, I have to go grab a snack. After a long night at a concert, I like to sleep in as late as I can, so sometimes it's hard finding the time to make breakfast before work. That's why I love Magic Spoon, the wholesome, high-quality cereal that has zero grams of sugar and no artificial ingredients. Plus, it's high in protein, so it keeps me fuller for longer and lets me focus on everything that's going on in rock and metal instead of worrying about how I'm going to meet my macros for the day. The variety pack features four delicious flavors, fruity, frost, cocoa, and peanut butter. It's really hard to pick a favorite, but I think the peanut butter is my number one. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five grams of net carbs in each serving, and each serving only has 140 calories. So it fits a variety of different lifestyles as it's keto friendly, gluten free, and free of grains, soy, and wheat. It has the same great taste that you love in your cereal, but with more protein and less sugar. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code LOUDWIRE at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash loudwire. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code LOUDWIRE for $5 off or go to Magic spoon.com slash loudwire to save five dollars today. Now back to business. There are some instances we should discuss that took place before Dave was even ousted from Metallica. In the summer of 82, Dave was selling weed and got a dog to protect his stash in his apartment. At one of their band practices, Dave brought the dog and it jumped on bassist Ron McGovney's car. James kicked the dog, so I punched him in the face and, and that was the end of it. Early the following year, while the band was driving across the country to start working on their debut album, their car hit black ice and slid off the interstate in Wyoming. Dave was driving. The car spun out of control and they all got out, and according to a letter Cliff wrote to his girlfriend at the time, another car lost control and crashed into their truck. Dave later said that was the moment he thinks his bandmates decided he needed to go. I kind of found out on the road how Dave was. <laughs> so the first thing when we met Johnny Z was 
Hi, we're here. Uh, you want to get rid of our guitar player? <laughs> One of the things that bothered Dave the most after being fired from Metallica, according to the rocker, was that he told them not to use his music. While he's credited on some songs on their debut, they reworked one in particular that was called Mechanics, which Dave had written before he was even in Metallica, and Metallica titled it The Four Horsemen. Regardless, Dave later included Mechanics on Megadeth's first album. Metallica started attracting more attention after the release of Kill 'Em All, and they didn't hold back about the firing of Dave in interviews. Lars told Metal Forces magazine in 84 that they never thought Dave was that great of a lead guitar player and that they knew that they wouldn't be able to carry on with him in the band. Metallica's second album, Ride the Lightning, came out in July of 84, which featured two more songs with Dave's writing credits. Meanwhile, Dave was still working on getting a record deal and a solid lineup for Megadeth. The following year, his band's debut, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good, came out, and he had his chance to sneer back at Metallica in interviews of his own. He told Metal Forces magazine that he didn't want to get too much into detail about his split with Metallica because he liked the guys in the band and didn't want to hurt their success. He added that he wasn't upset about the situation because he'd been wanting to work on his own project while still in Metallica anyway. Then, he said, in the past we had tried to kick both Lars and James out of the band. Lars started to cry because he didn't want to leave and we gave James a second chance because he wasn't singing too well at the time. But I really care about the guys a lot. They're doing really well and I'm getting money out of this, so why should I put them down and hurt my bankroll? Later in the conversation, Dave said that Kirk ripped off every lead break he played on Metallica's No Life to Leather demo and also took credit for writing a lot of their songs. So much for not getting into a lot of detail about it. This was a trend that continued in interviews, mainly because the press kept asking them about each other and about what had happened. Of course, Dave played off the situation like he wasn't bitter about it, but some of his comments said otherwise. We're a thinking band and they're a thrashing band. You know, and it's not that hard to, to sit there and go wheelie do on the leads, you know, instead of trying to do pentatonic inverted Weedly scales. Do. There were also times, though, where he admitted how difficult it was to watch the band he was originally the guitar player in go on to be so successful without him. There was a lot of jealousy and a lot of me dealing with what was going on in my head watching these guys achieve this stellar. Uh, position in the industry. He also felt even more disrespected by his former bandmates in September of 1986 when he found out that Cliff had died in a bus crash in Sweden through publicist and friend of both bands, Maria Ferrero. He said that he took it personally that they didn't tell him themselves. As a result, he penned the Megadeth track In My Darkest Hour, which appeared on their 1988 album, So Far, So Good, So What. Did you ever think that I needed love? Did you ever think, stop thinking you're the only one I'm thinking of? You'll never know how hard I tried to find my space and satisfy you too. By the early 90s, Dave and Megadeth proved that they weren't going anywhere. As Metallica were entering superstardom with the Black Album, Lars shared in an interview that he was friendly with his former bandmate, despite the ugly moments they had shared the decade prior. But He has a great band and he's uh, made some records that I really like. And um, when I see him when I'm in LA, I call him up once in a while, we hang out and so on. You know, a lot of that stuff that went on in the press for a couple of years, that was just silly. Then, in June of 93, Megadeth opened for Metallica in Milton Keynes, England. Today is a very historical day. Ten years of bullshit is over between Megadeth and Metallica. Years later, Dave and Metallica got to hash out a lot of their past when Metallica was working with a group therapist, and some of these conversations were recorded for the 2004 documentary, Some Kind of Monster. I think I've had an awareness of the pain I caused you. I mean, people hate me because of you. My God, Lars, you guys woke me up and said, you know what, you're out. And I asked you, what, no warning? Less than a decade later, it seemed that Dave and Metallica had put the past behind them when the big four shows took place in 2010. These concerts saw Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax, the big four of thrash, play a series of shows together to celebrate their impact on heavy metal. Dave said in an interview that he and James getting to embrace each other in front of the audience was a really big moment, as it's something Something that both of them and their fans have been waiting for for a very long time. It doesn't need to be the big four for me to want to play with uh, James and Lars. I think if the big four doesn't happen, then certainly a Megadeth Metallica tour would be great. The following year, Dave played with Metallica on stage for the first time since 1983 during the band's 30th anniversary shows, and Ron McGovney and guitarist Lloyd Grant also joined in on the celebrations. These onstage reunions were a breath of fresh air for thrash fans who'd been waiting to see their heroes get along again, but the disagreements were far from over. In 2015, Metallica re-released their 1982 demo, No Life to Leather, as part of a limited edition
edition record store day special. They planned to eventually reissue the demo on their own, but Day refused to sign off on it because, according to a post hero on Twitter, Lars wanted credits on two songs that Dave claimed to have written every note and every word to. Apparently, the Big Four had plans to do another series of shows at some point, but Dave insisted that Lars was the one preventing them from happening, asserting that he believed that Lars was afraid to play with Megadeth again. There have been other moments where Dave has made comments in the press about his time in Metallica and his impact on them, but none of it matches the pettiness of the way things were between them decades ago. Plus, the comments didn't stand in the way of James reaching out to Dave in late 2019 and offering his support after the Megadeth singer was diagnosed with throat cancer. Dave told Rolling Stone, I got a text message back from my old brother, James Hetfield, and I was so, so happy to hear from him. Contrary to what anybody says and contrary to any of the act that we put on, I love James and I know that James loves loves me and cares about me. You can see that when the moment of truth is here and I'm telling the world that I've got a life-threatening disease. Who comes to stand next to me? James. Dave then reached out to reassure James in the fall of 2022 after the Metallica frontman admitted that he's sometimes insecure about his guitar playing. And in the summer of 2023, Dave told Heavy Consequence that his relationship with James and Lars was better than it had ever been. Is there a clear winner in this situation? If you base the answer solely on which band is bigger, then it would be Metallica. If you base it on who was able to bounce back the most despite the odds being stacked against them, it would probably be Dave. Thus, we dubbed this match a draw. The fans win because we got two incredible bands out of the situation. Thanks so much for watching and let us know in the comments which feud you want to learn about next time.